Welcome everyone. My name is Dana White and today we have the extra special pleasure of a new series that we have launched that Will Lynn and I have launched with Dr. Dennis Slattery. Uh, this is just more special than you can possibly imagine. And as a way of opening this up, as you know, we have been producing, Will Lynn and I have been producing the Myth Salon for about four years. And it suddenly ramped up during the time of the coronavirus where we got, we're doing Myth Salons every other week now. And we've had interest in other faculty members like Lionel Corbett we're doing talks with. And now Dennis is coming on board to do these. At the end, we'll tell you a little bit more about our plans for a continued session with Dennis. As part of what came about, I was introduced via email uh, by Connie Zweig to Clyde Ford, who, famous book, Hero with African Face, <coughs> So I have been, I have been trading, I have been trading emails with Clyde because he's going to come and join us for our Myth Salon. Title of his new book is called Think Black. And it's so relevant to what we're experiencing in our country today. So I thought I would read you a little poem. I have always thought, I thought in color, dreamt in waves of blue skies, rolling green landscapes, rainbows, and shapes of puffy white clouds forming themselves into animals. But then I realized that textures, dirt and grime and grit, they don't penetrate my mind's world until I allow the outside in, until touch and contact become real, and I learn to feel pain, pressure, and love, until I become wounded. Love is the fingerprint of your edge and mine making contact. The definitions and separations blending into one another. I imagine ways for one thing to become another for change and transformation to pen the script of my soul's narrative, for me to try you on for size and to walk a mile in your shoes, to trespass the boundaries of my psyche, to learn the language of your vulnerability, so together we can construct trust. I seek ways to combine all the colors, to trash the ideas of purity, whiteness, and singularity, I want the colors to combine, yet preserve their hue, their uniqueness, as if the one in everything can express the all in one. A community is like a great chain of being, where shared essences course through the veins of the body, an organism with a heart beating that we are all in implicated in one another, like shards of the soul's code as necessary to one another as the sands are to the shoreline. So I'd like to do a real gratitude to Clyde Ford for his book, his works. I encourage you to look on Amazon for the full breadth of what he has written. He's a great man. And so with a little bit at the welcome, I would like to turn it over to my good friend and colleague, Will Lynn. Let him say a few words, then each of us will go around. And then we'll sit back and bask in the wisdom of Dennis Slattery. Thank you all. Thank you, Dennis. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd, I'd just like to, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, each of us is gonna introduce uh, why we are here, uh, John, Dara, Kwame, and, and Dennis, and why we want to commit our time to doing this uh, series of conversations with Dennis. 
And for me, there, there are really four reasons. And uh, the first reason um, is, uh, well, actually, I'm going to come back to the first reason. I want to respond to what, Dennis just, uh, what Dana just said uh, about Sangha, about community, because that's really one of the primary reasons why I'm doing this uh, for community, for the community of the six people on this screen and for the community of all the people that are joining us now. Uh, this is, uh, this is, that's one of the main reasons I'm doing it is it, it just feels good to be uh, with a community and and I think it's it's one of the three necessary things to progress with the spiritual life for a reason um, so the second reason why I'm doing this uh, is is plain and simply uh, Dennis it's just Dennis because really um, going back to his classes at Pacifica it was sitting in Dennis's classroom that made it so that that made me like you know when you feel like you've drank too much coffee but you can't move and you can't talk, but you're sitting there and you just have this like, what do I do with this energy? Move to California. I got to move to California. And I moved to California. And I think I honestly, it was the, the excitement I had in every one of Dennis's classes that, that confirmed that conviction that I needed to get out here. And it's the energy that he stimulates and it stimulated in me that that is one of the, probably the biggest reason why I wanted to do this uh, and want to support Dennis doing this. Um, the third reason is uh, conceptually just, I think that our world uh, benefits from more mythology and more mythopoesis. I think our world benefits from a more poetic relationship with nature, with, with, its, with the world, a more symbolic way of seeing things and reading things. And I think that Dennis is a, a true teacher uh, in, in leading us into that relationship, uh, more mythopoetic relationship with the world. And the fourth and final reason that I'll mention about why, why I'm so excited to be doing this is that, look, COVID is a crazy thing. We're in crazy times. I don't know where things are going, but if this is our World War II moment, I don't know. If it is, then one thing you look at in history is that the artists lead the academics. I'm very moved by what happened in 1949 when you have Hero with a Thousand Faces, Myth of the Eternal Return, and Lord of the Rings, these three great systemic breakthroughs in mythology. But I'm especially interested in the 1937 to 1939 Hobbit and Disney and uh, Marvel and DC because what something happened with the artists first before World War II and something happened with the systemic thought after. And so right now it feels like it's the time for the artists. It's a time to feed artists. It's a time to feed the creative soul because we don't know where it's going to go yet. We don't know what to say intellectually totally about this, but we do know that we should be feeding the creative soul. And I think that that's what this, program is first and foremost designed to do is cultivate creative relationship with the self uh, for creatives and for individuals. And, and I just feel like that's a very valuable and important thing to do, uh, period, right now. And with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand this torch off to the next one of us to introduce why uh, uh, he or she is doing this and hopefully say just a little bit about Dana, uh, Dennis to continue the introduction to him. Uh, John, do you mind jumping in next, please? Well, it's good to be here with all of you. As a storyteller and a writer, uh, I find myself very much during this period um, unsure of so many things. And I, I think if we've learned anything from uh, mythology or from the ancients, when you are unsure, maybe the most sure thing you can do is to go and be with your tribe. And tonight, uh, that's why I'm here. I'm, I'm here to be with my tribe. I'm here to be with others that experience the world through art and who see the world through artistic lenses. I'm here um, because I, I'm reminded of, of the idea that Thomas Merton offered us that art enables us to find ourselves and lose ourselves at the same time. And I'm hoping uh, that I, I can find a bit more of myself. I'm hoping that uh, through through the words of others, I can see myself more clearly. And I, I don't know about you, but I've really been wrestling with identity issues during these moments. And um, I, I think hearing someone like Dennis tonight and being able to dialogue with him about these ideas um, will bring a healing for many of us. And, and that really gets me to my final point of why I'm here, and that is because um, if you tell me that uh, Dennis Slattery is going to be talking about myth anywhere, I will be there. 
and I have been deeply impacted by uh, the way that Dennis has taught me uh, to, to look at my own art. Um, I believe just as much that is, as bad art can be actually damaging to a culture, um, that good art can be healing and, and uh, transcendent to a culture. And we need more voices like Dennis who can lead us into good art, better art, and to help us appreciate and promote uh, the type of art that our world needs right now. It's an honor to be here tonight. I would like to pass the microphone over to my dear friend, Kwame. Kwame, why are you here? Thanks, thanks, John. Um, I'm here uh, primarily because of, uh, of Dennis. Because of Dennis, just like Will said, wow, Dennis, just sitting in your classes, man. Uh, epic imagination, and then and then I pulled out one of my papers from uh, Mythical Poetic Images today, uh, and and read that. So I'm here because of Dennis, primarily, and uh, also um, myth myth. Um, when I when I first started studying myth, I saw the importance of mentoring, and, and um, I just found that, that uh, the mentee. Would, he, he would just sit and listen for the most part. And um, using the quotes with the youth, we say uh, water, water picks up the sediments of the channel which it travels. So, so I'm here because of you all too, okay? So when, so when Dana showed me the names, I was just like, wow, cool. So, so water picks up the sediments of the channel which it travels. Uh, Sufi saying, uh, he who travels without a guide needs 200 years for a two days journey. And my favorite one, you make your friends, your teachers, and you mingle the friendly art of conversation with the advantages of instruction. So I'm just here pretty much to learn. So today, this is new for me. I'm, I'm pretty much just gonna be a student. So I will speak when spoken to, but outside of that, I would prefer to just, uh, just, just, just go along for the ride. Okay, so wow. Glad to be here. Glad to, you know, really cool seeing you guys' faces. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. And um, I, I have to uh, join the chorus of, uh, of people who are here uh, because we are so privileged to have Dennis lead us again. Uh, uh, I, I remember every time I was in Dennis's class, I would arrive that day not knowing where I would go, but very sure it was going to be a great trip, <laughs> great journey. And I'm sure I will not be disappointed today. Um, I was really thrilled when uh, I heard from Dana and Will uh, that they were setting this up and uh, I was very honored they asked me to, to uh, join the panel. Um, uh, I, I hope as most of you know I, I, I work as a story analyst and um, one of the things that I have uh, observed in my work throughout the years is, or at least I'll tell you this is my, my prejudice, my bias towards this, is that um, in the same way that, that uh, the psyche communicates through, its, through our dreams, I really believe our culture communicates through our stories. And um, if, our, if, our, if our psyche is, is hurting, we seek help. You know, we, we, have, we have therapists, we have uh, uh, friends, we have counselors, uh, wise men and women who, who can help us through it. But when our culture is hurting um, and it is speaking through its stories, my question is who's listening? Who's paying attention? And um, I, I believe that our background and our training at Pacifica has really given us, uh, and, and not just Pacifica, because I think there are, uh, among the participants, I think many of you um, uh, are here because you, you, you didn't, specifically go to Pacifica, but you have studied yourself and you have a deep interest in this. And um, we have training and we have an understanding and a background of how, how to keep our ear to the ground, how to see these ar archetypal images as they, they spontaneously arise and to greet them. And, uh, um, you know, Will, in the same way that you brought up uh, uh, all of the, the narratives and the storytelling that uh, were, were in some way so prophetic uh, at other crisis points in, in our times, I really think 
we need to be need to be paying attention to our stories um, and not just the beautiful well organized stories but we've been having apocalyptic fiction and zombie fiction and all kinds of things uh, for a long time now and uh, I, I think there's a very clear voice speaking through a lot of this material that we have to get past the sort of the uh, literary judgment and uh, be listening more deeply because there are there is information about fear and horror and um, uh, feeling lost and feeling disconnected and uh, if we can can collectively you know really open open ourselves to our stories and hear them uh, we can also find collective ways to respond. And um, I think that's just really important and critical right now. So uh, like Kwame, I'll speak when I'm spoken to, but I am just thrilled to, to be able to, well, sit back and, and just enjoy where we're headed. And uh, uh, by the way, I just wanna add one little note. I'm so thrilled you're, you're bringing Clyde Ford on. I've had the privilege to teach with him and not only is he a wonderful writer, he is the most amazing speaker and teacher and you will just absolutely, absolutely love, love his work and love what he is doing. So I encourage you to buy his book and uh, join, in, join in the work ahead because it's gonna be wonderful. So, and now to Dennis. <laughs> Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed uh, by your comments, your, your love, your uh, authenticity. It's uh, really quite moving. And uh, I can't thank you enough, uh, all of you, and all of you participants out there who have joined uh, for today. Um, I'm just very excited to present, um, you know, I hope for uh, several. Uh, meetings, and as I mentioned to Will this afternoon, um, I've done a lot of writing and publishing, but there is so much that I've written and published that I've never had an audience for, uh, where I could present and then receive some responses on how it's working, how what it's bringing up for you. So um, it's like a new medium uh, for me, and so I'm just very grateful and to Dana and Will for um, orchestrating this and setting it up. And just, I, I just want to underscore too the context in which we're all here, uh, an explosive pandemic that is getting legs under it that um, couldn't even be foreseen. And the, uh, I live in Texas, uh, about 45 miles north of San Antonio, and about 50 miles south of Austin. And so we're in the thick of it. And I count my blessings that uh, two weeks ago today, I had gallbladder surgery and the hospital um, occupancy was modest. Uh, today, they're all but filled. And so it was um, a, a bit of a rough time, but nothing like today in the state of Texas, uh, if one has to be hospitalized uh, for whatever reason. So um, I just want to acknowledge all who have died and all who have been infected and that we keep them in our prayers and in our thoughts. I want to begin with an image and I'm going to hold it up. So this is, this is an ammonite uh, pulled out of a desert close to Morocco, and it's estimated that it's seven million years old. And it's uh, one of the most beautiful spirals. I'm trying to get the light not to hit it so that you can see it. Here's the backside of it, uh, kind of crude, kind of coarse, but then when it's sliced open, it creates this ma majestic aesthetic image of the spiral. And I don't know why, but I began using this uh, when I would offer writing personal myth retreats, and I would hand it to the person to my left, and he or she would hold it, and I asked them, just look at it for 15 seconds. Introduce yourself. Um, 
maybe make a comment of uh, how you've been occupying your life and maybe one thing that you're thinking about wanting to get out of this usually three days, uh, three and a half day uh, writing retreat. So hundreds and hundreds of participants have handled this. And while you can't, I just ask you to imagine if we had the time uh, for this to be passed to you and you identify yourself uh, to the group. It wasn't until several years uh, after I began using it that uh, I came across in the um, uh, dream seminars, 1928 to 1930, in which Jung is with two um, colleagues and they're working one dream after another. And the dreams are short, two to four sentences. Well, I'll never forget on page 100, left side of the page, Jung is riffing off of a dream <clears throat> that uh, has been presented. And he makes a, an allusion to nature. And then he says the following, and I have it pretty much memorized. He says, all psychic development is spiralic. We are always folding back, but we can't land on where we once were, but we can land a little bit above it or a little bit below it. And as Thomas Wolfe told us many years ago, you can't go home again. But Slattery has a codicil of that. True enough, but you can get back into the neighborhood so that you're not back at home, but you're in the neighborhood. I love that it was, it struck me so powerfully that Jung gave psychic development a geometry and it's the spiral, not the circle. So I just share that with you to give this a little bit of a history and a little bit of a context. And for my own thinking, I think the, I think the act, the creative act of learning is spiralic where we go back and we retrieve something, we pull something forward, uh, maybe in a new context, and then we push it forward. And as Dara was saying a moment ago, and then we see where it goes, and we don't know. And that's part of the wonder, as John has spoken, uh, when he spoke at the Miss Salon so beautifully about curiosity and, and wonder. So I am excited to present, and I'm going to get going here, but I really, um, I, I work best in an interactive environment, uh, in the classroom, in conversation. So I wanna present for about 30 minutes, and then I'm gonna pause and check in with you all, uh, both the panel uh, and the participants. And I don't know how much material I have here, but knowing that I'm Irish Catholic compulsive, I know that I probably have two to three times what we can get to, but that makes me comfortable to have excess. Um, and so let's see how far we go and if we care to pick up the remainder of it uh, in a second uh, class. So there's two parts that I have for you. Um, one is on the goddess Hestia, because I'd like to give. Um, what I'm going to say, uh, a mythic uh, inflection through this wonderful goddess um, who um, I fell in love with through an article by uh, a student who was a year behind me at the University of Dallas in the early 70s, Barbara Kirksey. And I bet many of you know the volume by James. Hillman called Facing the Gods, which he edited. And I think there's seven essays uh, on a different god or goddess. And I was reading it just randomly um, a couple of years ago, actually. And I came on Barbara Kirksey's essay on Hestia, and it just opened up something in me, and I knew I had to write about it. 
So I'm going to start with that. And then um, I'm not sure if we'll get all the way through it. I may pause before it. I'll watch the clock. <coughs> and then I'd like to shift um, to Dante's La Vida Nuova, in which he has a vision that determines the trajectory of the rest of his life. And both of these are in the service of a topic that Will suggested. Um, Oh, it's been a couple of weeks now. He says, I'm really interested, and especially given the school that he teaches at and, and, and directs, uh, between myth and art. And is, is it seamless? Is there a gap? And so I want to use a couple of the sonnets of the 41 sonnets that comprise La Vida Nuova to have us explore um, what Beatrice at some point entered our life as a vision that gave our lives the trajectory that it's been on uh, ever since. So the analogies that Dante um, uh, provokes, uh, I think are really worth considering vis-a-vis -vis the personal myth that each of us is living in. Okay, so that's the frame. So let me get started. I was going to go to the writing myth book uh, to offer a few comments about personal myth, but I decided I have plenty here. And <clears throat> if we have the sustaining power to do several of these um, classes with uh, all of you participating, I want to do, I want to do at least half of a session on my book, Writing Myth, Mythic Writing, and delineate further, not only the spiral, but um, uh, some characteristics uh, of personal myth that I've come to, and uh, a few that I've read that I incorporated into that book. So, so I wanna begin with a mythic image and uh, we're at about 7.30, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my eye out for around 8 o'clock or perhaps a few minutes uh, after. So I want to begin with this mythic image, a mythic figure that I hope will ground my observations at the same time that it sets up conversation. I came across Hestia in an article uh, that uh, I mentioned Barbara Kirksey had written. So um, I thought it pertinent to ask, what god or goddess gathers us around the heart's way of knowing? Now this, this way of heart knowing is finally what led Dante to write the Divine Comedy. But through the vessel of the Vita Nuova, so this heart knowing, um, the, uh, what Dante calls intelletto de amore, the heart's intelligence, the love's intelligence. I'm fascinated with the feeling of that and um, linking the heart to gnosis, to a way of knowing, uh, if not a way of being. So Barbara's Fine essay on Hestia, a background of psychological focusing is the subtitle. I think it helps us see some outlines of this goddess that is central to the hearth of um, this class. We learn that Hestia is the oldest of Kronos and Rhea's children and the youngest since she was the first to be swallowed and the last to return from Kronos's stomach. Does this, in, and this is a question that I pose to me, you may want to entertain it when we take a pause. <coughs> Does this endow her with a sense of all time, of the first and the last, the alpha, and the omega of, of a life, of a feeling, or an idea. 
something inclusive, I sense, attends her position in the stomach of time itself. Is she the divine presence that surrounds a gut feeling of struggling to stomach what is unpleasant or irritable when we might be tempted to throw up our hands, our stomach, our tolerance, our patience, and to allow us to stomach what is so unfamiliar as to make us wish to throw it out, hurl it as far as we can, or to deny it and simply dispense with it. When we feel we are about to lose heart, does she, Hestia, stifle such a moment to allow us to entertain it further? And I'll say something in a moment about Hestia and her ability to entertain. And if you don't mind, I'm going to pause once in a while to take a sip of uh, hot tea. Little is known about her, but for the purposes of this presentation, let's move to how she fits into heart work. <laughs> she was worshipped at the center of the city. She dwelled at the heart of the polis, and by occupying that position, she gave it an order that it would not have without her. Uh, ordinary principle is at the heart of art and of myth. An order, ordering principle. This is, what I, this is what happens to me when I take a typed manuscript and then write cursively into it. Then I understand my students' um, rightful complaint. Well, I'm glad about the grade, but I can't read your writing. Can you fill me in here? And then we pause, and I usually make something up because I can't read it either. So she's an ordering principle at the heart of art and myth. I've got Will's. Um, mandate here to try to work uh, this uh, space between. Hestia was presented often as a heap of live coals. The umphalos, or the navel, at Delphi, the center of the world. So centering seems to be a um, inflected uh, virtue that Hestia carries. Her Roman counterpart, you know, is Vesta. And in Rome, where we lived for two years, 1976 through 1978, <clears throat> one of our favorite uh, monuments in the city, very close to the heart of the city, was the temple to Vesta, this elegant, modest, round circle in which is carried the city's hearth fire. And in Roman, mythology, it was believed that Rome would survive until and unless that fire in the Temple of Vesta was extinguished, and that would signal the, the end of Rome. So um, she's important, and she carries the circle, the geometry of the circle. Now, on an affective level, when I read of Hestia, something happens inside. I begin to dream of the hearth place, red, glowing, welcoming. For me, Hestia is heartfeltness. She inspires such a disposition. And I'm also thinking, even as I'm speaking microcosmically about one goddess, I'm asking myself too, is this part of the Greeks' wisdom that they understood that all of these qualities and impulses are in the soul of each of us? And what they did, not quite simply, I was gonna say simply, but it's not simply, they gave each of these some outer image by which to contemplate them. So I ask you to think about what is it that the goddess or divinities um, offer us that maybe we can't get to without them. They give us the via or the road in, maybe a corridor uh, in. 
heart knowing is a disposition to knowing as well as a content of something known. So myths for me, I'm going to extrapolate a little bit too as I, as I move through this. <clears throat> the power of myths is not, it doesn't reside simply in the content of the myth, but the context in which the myth is asked to be read, uh, entertained, uh, interpreted. So both content and context, for me, mythically, are equally as valid and necessary. I say this to set up uh, to set us up for Dante's experience of Beatrice as a Hestian moment. And I'll say more about that, but I want to try to make some linkages even early on here. So while there are two pieces, I think uh, I, I'll, I'll feel better if I'm linking them some way, not uniting them, but at least making some connective tissue. Um, in Hestia's presence, <clears throat> One warms to one subject matter, one situation, to another person. Whatever is presenting itself, she warms relationships. <clears throat> she warms them up. She doesn't heat them up. She's not, she's not fire. She's the, she's the low glowing coals. When we feel we are warming to a person, or to an idea, to an event or a situation, Hestia is present as an impulse, <clears throat> but even more importantly, as an attitude. So I'm thinking these days about these mythic figures as attitudes towards experience, if not attitudes towards ourselves. With her presence, something that begins to be heartfelt and will be recollected in that same way. Something lying bitter in the memory can sweeten over time with the presence of Hestia's presence in remembering. She can transform the way something is recollected and is gathered again into consciousness. I also believe she is central to the acts of reading and writing, especially in those moments when we sense a deepening and realize we are reading or writing from a place other than conscious cognition. Something else enters, some other way of evoking ideas, new insights, and feelings in these processes. Hestian moments were in the heart, the heart is allowed in. Feelings themselves ripen into insights. I want to read that again. Feelings themselves in Hestia's presence can ripen <clears throat> into insights. In writing these words, I tried to give myself completely over to the presence of this marvelous feminine figure in the Greek pantheon. Hestia's prevalent image is not of a person, but of a situation. Now you can go online and type in Hestia and you'll get a thousand images. Uh, I find all of them unsatisfactory. I don't think she's a figure in the way that other gods and goddesses are figures. She's a presence. The heart and the fire are contained in this image of her, or in this situation that she fosters. I think it's both the hearth fire as well as the heart's fire. We learned from Barbara's essay, <clears throat> and now I'm quoting from her. Hestia is the domestic fire and makes feasts possible, end of quote. One who has an open hearth, a welcoming hearth, also has an open, welcoming heart. 
a warmth <clears throat> that people wish to gather around and to be heated by. As such a divine presence, <clears throat> she condenses hearth and soul. Barbara also reveals <clears throat> to us that Hestia's value in psychological life is her ability to mediate soul by giving a place to congregate, a gathering point, not unlike this, not unlike the situation that we're all engaged in right now. And I loved your comments at the beginning because you all called up Hestia in your own, in your own way, in your own vocabulary. <clears throat> she may be the Greek patron saint of conferences, workshops, retreats, even the classroom when it is function, functioning as it should. <clears throat> this is my sense, as a place of ideas freely moving and uniting around a central text or a central idea, the heart of the days matter. In any of these venues, she congeals soul and place and welcomes so to entertain ideas various and contradictory points of view, let them in. Energetic exchanges, dissent, but always with an underlying structure of hospitality, uniting people and ideas <clears throat> by and not in spite of their differences. <clears throat> As goddess of hospitality, she is ever present in Homer's Odyssey where hospitality towards the stranger is bedrock to the continuation of civilization. That guest host relationship has to be hospitable to the stranger. Divisiveness, hostility toward the other as stranger, domination of the other are clear signals of Hestia's absence. I'll say more of this in just a couple of moments. I have for years, often in a very unconscious way, <clears throat> been rising at 4 a.m., perhaps for the past 26 years. When I enter my study in the deep darkness of outside, I create a space for what might happen this particular morning. I light a candle. I often light a stick of incense. Then I settle into journal writing <clears throat> and ask simply, what wants to be remembered from the day before? And then I sit quietly. And then something inevitably pops up and then I start. <clears throat> As I read in the morning, <clears throat> I beg your pardon, for instance, and something suddenly calls to me to underline it or to pause over it, to write something in my tablet or to pen a few words in the margin to return to later, Hestia is guiding me. She brings the virginal into secular space. What is sacred, unpolluted, carrying with it a profound purity a cleansing, and maybe most important of all, a sharpening of focus. Her flame's presence creates a dwelling. She allows my imagination to dwell in a particular unique way, which I must admit begins to fade at the first daylight. The graying of the sky, outside my study window, then some transition takes place inevitably. As Hestia was the first and last out of her father Kronos's stomach, so is focusing the point of both beginning and ending, and that's Barbara Kirksey's uh, notion. As beginning and ending, Hestia helps us to break out of linear thought exclusively, and she opens us to circularity, the realm of mythos. 
I would offer here that one investment of myth of myth is that it is a way or a via that promotes focusing. What allows me to focus on anything is the myth I'm in and perceiving by means of. What I focus on is mythos. <clears throat> to bring an image into focus situates it at a place where it produces itself repeatedly. Writing and reading are two forms of focusing or focusing in on something that has attracted our attention. There exists as well a heat or a fire to focusing, a focusing fire. When an image I am trying to bring into focus, perhaps it's a way of trying to bring an image home to the illumination of the hearth comes more into itself in a sharp, sharpened focus. The lens is to move, not the image. Hestia is the lens, I think, of sharp focusing, of clearing all debris from the image so that it, it can speak on its own terms, allowing it to become hospitable to invite hospitality. I would suggest to you that an, <clears throat> that an image out of focus with blurry edges and a fuzzy halo about it is an unhestian image, an image that has not yet enjoyed the hospitality of Hestia. Not through argument or logos, but more through guesting the image does Hestian warmth begin to affect the image to invite it into greater focus. The image is now open to expose its own heart, its heat, and even more importantly, its possibilities. What are possible in the image? When that question comes to us, I think Hestia is sitting next to you, next to us. <clears throat> the German word herd, H-E-R-D, is the word for hearth, which is the same etymologically as to focus. Barbara gives us that beautiful uh, connective tissue uh, in her, in her uh, essay. So an image's focus is its center, its hearth place, where the greatest energy of a storm gathers even a volcanic eruption. Quote, finding a place for is a Hestian activity. When an image finds its right place, then it is fully a guest that can enlighten us and illuminate us. We know the image from its deepest interior outward. Reading, Writing, speaking some idea or image into being is Hestian behavior because, and I've just got a few bullet points that I'd like to share with you. Reading is a way of finding the hearth of a thought. It aids in focusing. It aids in amplifying and allows words, <clears throat> imperfection, even diseases in. It lets images help me focus rather than I focus on the image or the idea <clears throat> for one perspective only. Reading then is a lens allowing or inviting focal adjustment. Hospitality is big heartedness. So when I read, and I, I think this is true of writing as well, but I'm thinking about reading. When I read, I journey. I journey towards and hope to find the hearth. I do both at once. This is from a, a lengthier version of this Hestian uh, article that I decided I, I really want to include. 
now there might be a little bit of overlap, a little bit of redundancy, but just um, forgive that. Within her presence, uh, within her pristine position, Hestia is able to guard images. Hestia illuminates. Her illuminating <clears throat> provides <clears throat> protection and fostering of the image. That's Barbara Kirksey. Perhaps the early Greeks felt there was some sacred, even divine quality to the image, <clears throat> so they assigned a goddess to hold it. In an imaginal way, <clears throat> Hestia amplifies the image, seeing by means of her illuminating prowess <clears throat> into the image's possibilities. Learning takes place precisely in this instant of amplification as well as protection. On this note, <clears throat> perhaps we can venture that Hestia is very close <clears throat> and instrumental to the origin of myth itself. If you'll entertain that myth is akin to a via, an avenue or corridor that promotes focusing. So I want you to entertain the notion <clears throat> that one of the virtues of myth is they help promote focusing, not fixation, but focusing. A myth can also include a particular style of understanding. I've thought of, I've thought recently about myth and style. Are, are myths styles of being aware, styles of focusing? And I, I pose it as questions because I, I'm entertaining that, but I'm not sure. What allows me to focus on anything is the myth that I'm in and perceiving by. I said there'd be some redundancy. My personal myth is like my home. From it, I look out through very unique windows and doors onto the world. It's the home base of my illumination where I am lit up by an idea, like the light bulb over the cartoon character's head. <clears throat> that light bulb carries the wattage of Hestian illumination. It carries the energy of the Eureka moment. That is such a delight when it occurs because it transports us to another home base from which to understand something new or to understand something old in a novel way. Barbara further illuminates the rich complexity of Hestia, Hestia by relating an insight by the Roman poet Ovid. And that is that the word focus and hearth is so named from the flames and because it fosters all things, Ovid. To continue the idea of myth stated above, what allows me to focus on anything is the myth that I'm in and perceiving by means of. Myth may be understood then as a focal plane and a focal point. It is where energy gathers to make something meaningfully and often originally present. Hestia is a goddess of presencing, of bringing into view, of crossing and pausing in my field of vision. Any of us can experience moments in our lives where our trajectory, our purpose, and pursuits are all out of focus. Art, poetry, therapy, writing, painting, conversation are opportunities for regaining our focus, which is to say, our purpose. Absent any tincture of Hestia, a life can become out of control, unfocused, without direction, and empty. We are not home any place under any circumstances. 
And so we wander in the world orphaned. That's an unhestian life. Self-image then may at times appear and feel distorted, indistinct, or simply in opposition to our earlier image of ourselves. Sharpening our focus is a form of remythologizing our lives, infusing it with clear purpose and vision. And that is starting to point at La Vida Nuova. Barbara believes that, quote, returning to an image again and again from various directions is an attempt to focus. It's an attempt to find the fire of the image, maybe the fire in the image. This is imagining in a Hestian mode, she writes. When we repeat a thought, an action, an attitude, it has a chance to grab hold with ongoing energy. Hestia then is also part of repetition of pattern constructing and pattern maintaining. Writing, rewriting, revising are Hestian behaviors, for in the rewriting, one's focus sharpens. Fire, light, illumination, clarify. They show boundaries and borders. They make a crisp image, rich and subtle. A certain clarity promotes nuanced and subtle seeing. Hestia helps us nuance the things of the world. She may be the source of nuancing itself. Uh, so she helps us nuance the things of the world we focus on and find important even indispensable. I would add that like writing and rewriting, reading and rereading are also Hestian. Repetition to sharpen and deepen our understanding invites Hestia into such a place. When we reread, for instance, we see details, connections, and associations that the first readed, reading skidded over and just missed. Rereading, I have found, is never just re, a doing again. It is a movement into the unfamiliar because we are now familiar through the first reading of what is present. Now we can focus on what was not there in that virginal reading. Barbara reveals at the end of her rich essay how Hestia joins two elements of human understanding back together that have suffered separation for millennia, and those are imagination and perception. Together, they help to foster what she calls a central virtue of Hestia, and I've already mentioned it, hospitality. As the guest-host relationship is so central to the action of Homer's Odyssey, as I mentioned, um, as Odysseus struggles to regain the hearth in his home with the assistance of his son and wife, Penelope, so does Hestia offer a rich and welcoming ground for ideas and images to be entertained. Being hospitable to ideas and opinions goes much further than being in opposition or at war with those that question or disagree with one's own, with one's own. In making this connection with Homer's epic, I would venture that there may be present in the Hestian hearth, uh, hearth presence, the element of restraint of pausing and of holding back in order for, for what needs to be present itself in its fullness to become apparent. It's a form of patience or of dwelling with rather than mastery over. Patience and restraint 
of allowing time to host an idea, allowing time itself to host an idea or an image or another person seem to be Hestian attributes. The slow glow of the hearth fire is an apt metaphor for Hestian speed. It dwells rather than races. It inhabits instead of darting here to there. And it settles rather than scoots aimlessly. So hosting ideas allows them the safe space, space to be voiced and heard. Uh, it's one of the reasons I keep coming back to the Miss Salons, because that's, allow <clears throat> that's not only allowed for, it's encouraged. Um, so to guest, um, uh, guesting ideas is the voice of the visitor, the newcomer, the one seeking to feel at home with his or her thoughts and opinions. Conversation, so absent in today's cultural sites, witnesses the presence of Hesty in space, and a word that we don't hear too often anymore, courtesy. A word whose etymology returns us to the heart. Courteous acts like listening and then speaking without attacking or colonizing the other's understanding evoke the presence of Hestia. In authentic conversation, we adjust to the other's thought, insights, speech, or writing and they in turn adjust to ours. Not agreement necessarily, but perhaps a certain consensus is the offspring of Hestian conversation. Not agreement, but consensus. I think they're, I think they're different in uh, some important ways. Hospitality then is an opulent form of big heartedness. I think it takes a large heart or great souledness to listen with real attention to another without violating that space with one's overriding opinion or response. Warming to the other's ideas is not synonymous with surrendering to them or to pretend one agrees. Rather, it is to allow the fire of their own perspective to infiltrate and perhaps modulate our own stance. Allowing such is a grandly hospitable endeavor that allows one to dwell with a contrary point of view in apposition, not opposition. <clears throat> in his lead article on the necessity of abnormal psychology, Ananke and Athena, James Hillman posits this bold and provocative insight. Here's what James writes. What the gods show in an imaginal realm of myth is reflected in our, in our imagination as fantasy. Let me read it again. What the gods show in an imaginal realm of myth is reflected in our imagination as fantasy. End of quote. Hestia is an archetype of the imaginal realm who bestows on our own imagination a civility, a courtesy, and a continuity because of her gifts of focusing, hospitality, and hearthpitality. I hope you'll allow that neologism, it's clumsy, but uh, I still like it, hearthpitality. Without her, Learning and human relationships would be flat, self-absorbed, static, and most likely in continual strife. In closing, I think it is Hestia's dynamism with her central image of the hearth fire that most animates my interest in her. She is less a goddess of acquiescence than she is of acceptance less of yielding, more of a yearning, less hellfire, more hearthfire. 
when we notice that more of what surrounds us and dwells within us is placeless and homeless, even orphan, in thought, purpose, insight, or voice, we may be drawn to light a candle to Hestia to invite her in. She comes, I believe, by invitation only. When she shows up, be prepared to be a proper host so she can guest herself into our souls, there to kindle a fire that might have gone out without our even being aware of it. Her presence <clears throat> will <clears throat> her presence will spark gratitude in any who care to notice her. Yeah. So let me stop there and thank you for your attention to some of those um, musings. And now I'd like to open up a space uh, for any of you, for all of you, um, uh, for any reflection, any observation, um, where Hestia stepped in front of you and said, Look here. Dennis, I'm really struck by everything that you said during this. And the thing that occurs to me in talking about Hestia is that her forms of expression are more about being rather than doing. So she yep. seems to be a condition rather than a, an activity. Yep. Um, a lot of the gods that we have studied at Pacifica and everywhere else are, are context driven and um, they're, they're, they're action gods. They're, they're gods that are on the move. And, and what you're bringing up is the center of if we listen to our heart, if we listen to that quiet sense, the silence, the warmth that beats inside all of us, we can silence that, that loquacious voice that seems to be taking over much of our narrative. And, and I just, I think that what you did was you, you started this off in a in a place of listening, and I and I really commend you for it, and I thank you for it. And with that, I I want to say less and hear more. I noticed that John has unmuted himself, and maybe you you would jump in there. Thank you, Dana. Yeah, uh, Dennis, um, one of the the thousand treasures that you laid before us here in the last uh, 30 minutes that really struck me was this connection uh, between myth and focus. And uh, as you talked about the, the idea of rewriting as focus and rereading as focus, I think I'd always thought of those two processes as being a very linear process of getting from point A to point B. I get from unfocused to focused. However, as I, I heard you talking about it, it occurred to me in much of my work, um, you know, where we're dealing with cameras, when you find the focus on an image, it's because you go in and out of focus in order to finally find that image. It's, it's not a linear process. You're going back and forth between out of focus and in focus. And it, it was comforting to me to hear you say that's that's part of uh, the process, you know, in rewriting and in rereading. I just wonder, could you speak to that just a bit more? Um, because my my heart was exploding in my chest uh, as you were talking about that. Um, I just wonder if you could just elaborate on that just a bit more. Well, I love the lens, and I love the circularity of. Uh, Hesty in space. So, I mean, your, your, your example is a beautiful illustration of that turning. And, you know, even as I'm doing this and seeing myself in the mirror of the screen doing this, 
this this is already starting to implicate the spiral. You know, it's that turning back and forth. So the reality blurs, then it, uh, um, <clears throat> what did Leonardo, I just finished the uh, Walter Isaacson's magnificent biography, uh, 600 pages of Leonardo uh, last night. And uh, he, uh, Isaacson is so beautiful in reading <clears throat> many of Leonardo's uh, paintings. But Leonardo perfected the sfumato, <laughs> S-M-S-F-U-M-A-T-O, the blurring of the boundary, the shadow, so that shadow and places that are shadowy and places that are light blend into each other. There's no line between them. And I'm thinking of that sfumato method that Leonardo perfected as part of the lens of um, blurring and then sharpening, blurring and then sharpening. And John, for me, that's what conversation, good conversation where people are listening to each other and riffing off of maybe what somebody said, you know, you can, you, your, your ear picks up that blurring. And uh, well, it's not just, quite clear yet to me. And yeah, so it's all of a piece, but this is all, uh, as Dana so well said, Hesti is a presence, it's, is a presencing. You know, she's the attitude of presencing, if I could uh, say it that way. So anyhow, that's, that's where I am, John, with your wonderful camera image. Um, you know, uh, as uh, as we were diving, thank you, Dennis. That, that was so uh, took me back. <laughs> so 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 glad to uh, uh, be listening again. Um, thank you, Sarah. Uh, you know, uh, I, when we talk about the subject of uh, mythopoesis, I, I think we have to be aware that it's not a thing. <laughs> it's it's not a, it's not an act you consciously do. It's the idea that just in the same way individuals individuate and grow, so the culture grows as well. And so the stories we tell are going to, to uh, reflect our transformation. And um, uh, I, I posed at the beginning how um, our stories are how the culture shares shares, you know, shares its pain, shares its hurt, shares its identity, and so on and so forth. And uh, something, so something in all of that really struck me in what you said, because this idea of re-listening, that um, the stories are there. In other words, who we are as a culture, where we are, is self-evident. If, if you have the capacity to, to read it and, and, and see and see it for what it is. And as I, I pose the question, you know, who who is doing that? <laughs> and I think a lot of us are stuck on the first read. And so we are very limited in our view because our first read tends to be through the filter of our own bias. And so we only hear what we hear, you know, and we we aren't we don't have have much of a capacity to see what the heart wants to tell us. And in particular, it, it just made me jump over and think about uh, uh, when Kaepernick took a knee and um, uh, how, how the story that got associated with it didn't want to acknowledge what it was. It was limited to its own view of, of what that was. And uh, the story of Black Lives Matter and the stories, it's, we have to re-listen because in, 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 not, in not having the capacity to see through what is going on and what it's telling us about who we are and where we are going, um, we, we're, we're not moving with, with the flow of energy. I mean, and that's, you know, that's what transformation is. Um, 
transformation takes consciousness and it takes it, it takes effort applied over time to transform and uh, um, you know we we have to understand that uh, you know we're I think we're, we're living in a time where the story is transforming so fast um, uh, not only do we do people have to you know, uh, uh, um, catch on to uh, what's going on on the progressive realm, but also on the progressive realm, we need to hear the story of those who haven't caught up um, because we're all not listening. We all are putting the filter and not not getting to the re-listening and, and the re-understanding of the stories we're telling ourselves because those stories um, can lead to a much healthier environment if, if we have the capacity to to see into that wound Yes, and help it heal The image that came up uh, as I listened to you Dara We used to we wore them in Cleveland right by uh, Lake Erie they're fr frozen bitter winters these big mufflers uh, on our heads sometimes mm -hmm. with a wool cap maybe and then the mufflers or, or earplugs. That's what ideologies do. <clears throat> they stop us from being able to hear anything that is not ideologically inflected towards what our ears are accustomed to. So, yes. And so how to, I mean, I don't want to go to how, I don't, but breaking through, um, well, can, so I, can I comment on that? Uh, the only comment I will make is that I remember once uh, I, I was in therapy and I was very frustrated because I, I don't remember even what the issue was, but I was frustrated that I, that I didn't feel I was being heard. <laughs> I remember, this is great advice, my therapist said to me, she says, just keep saying it over and over <laughs> as unemotionally as you can, and you yeah. will be heard, you know, it will be heard. And I think that that's, yeah. that's, a, that's really great <laughs> advice. We can't give up on the narrative. We can't give up on the no. story. We can't, um, the, I also wrote down as you were talking, um, using the whole image of Hestia minding the fire, because um, if we are persistent, the, I, the idea will catch fire. And we're seeing that right now. We're seeing that right now with the Black Lives Movement. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and uh, um, I, I think example. we we just we have to be persistent. We have to be persistent to hear the story and to tell the story. And to tell the story. Very nice. Yes. Yeah. Beautifully said. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to jump in on that portion about the uh, the system and the way that the systems can get. Uh, uh, like mufflers, where you stop listening to things outside of the system. So, you know, if you want the system to be ordered, you want it to be as cold as possible. Because when it's cold as possible, every piece in the system, if you get to the Bose-Einstein condensate, when things are so cold that the electron can't even stay separate from the proton, boom, right? It's so cold mm -hmm. that the system becomes so ordered, right? So, but when, it, when the system is so ordered, there's no individuality left. Inside this. So there's something interesting about warm, if the system can be seen as the home, as the, the macrocosm, as the space, yeah. and the individual as in that space, then a frozen system has no lateral freedom for the individual. And a warmed system uh, is true. a system where things can move around. We're not, in, we're not in a solid state. Yeah, 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 it's a great, great analogy, Will. Great it analogy. If I can keep building off that, the part of where that comes from is uh, um, I'm listening to you. What I'm thinking about a lot is the relation where Hestia seems to, in some ways, represent the relationship between the macro and the micro, where the big picture <laughs> pops into an insight and you see the system in an idea, where you know the world becomes the world navel, where the hospitality of the the space to the individual, right? The, yep. feelings, the big feelings become the focused insights. Uh, yep. The whole home becomes the focused hearth. The Rome is represented by the fire. And the heart knowing 
may actually even be something like that. The, the knowing that is the relationship of the micro to the macro, the knowing of the macro through the micro to know the macro uh, or some, something like this. Uh, the polis and the hearth and so anyway i just wondered if that sounded sounded resonant to you that that hestia kind of maybe re represents the dynamic relationships of the whole with the individual and the individual with the whole the world with the micro and the macro with the micro i think that's the big heartedness of hestia hmm. that there's space for all of that and there isn't a selecting process and one always has to ask who's doing that selecting, as Dara was uh, uh, implicating a, just a couple of minutes ago. But I think that's the beauty of her generosity as a presence and as an attitude, that if, if, the, space, if the space stays loose enough and elastic enough that other possibilities see, oh, there's, there's uh, some space for me in this. Um, I, I think that's when learning, you know, is one of the times when authentic learning really takes place. And it's that, it's that open heartedness to other possibilities. And as I mentioned, not that you then yield to it, because you may feel, well, I don't, I don't buy it, but I want to hear you articulate it. Well, there's hope there. <laughs> yeah, there's hope there. I'm gonna jump in. I'm gonna jump yes, in. please, Kwame. Thanks, thanks, Dennis. Um, uh, a few things yes, resonated, uh, especially the listening piece, and then and then Daryl, you're talking about the own biases with the youth. Uh, uh, as many of you know, we, we get them in sixth grade, keep them until they graduate from high school, all through myths and fairy tales, but but a lot of quotes. Uh, Dare you talking about the own biases. A uh, few of the quotes we use, they say, uh, only an open mind can contain the secrets of the universe. They say, a child who never leaves home believes his mom is the best cook. Um, with the youth, the one thing that, that's so impressive um, is just the intensity of their listening. OK, because basically, basically, we tell them, generally speaking, life is about it's, it's about making decisions. It's about making decisions. And, and, and generally speaking, the, the more information you have, the better decision you'll make. So it's so interesting in the myths, you know, when we'll ask the youth, you know, if they, they have to make a decision. I don't really care what their decision is, but I, I, what I'm more focused on is why they're making the decision. And then for them to listen to the other youth and listen to their rationale. And one of the most rewarding things is to hear one of the youth change their mind based <laughs> on listening to somebody else. So yeah, so I mean, yeah. it's just important, it's just the importance of listening is just so. Yeah. And another thing, Dennis, that you were saying uh, uh, that resonated was uh, the importance of the, the, the relationship between the guests and the host. And you said you were gonna kind of, kind of touch on it later, uh, Hestia's absence, because in America right now, Hesty ain't present. <laughs> okay. no. Hesty ain't present right now. No. <laughs> okay. So, no. Thanks, brother. Thanks, yes. man. Yes. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Kwame. Anybody else uh, out there? Should we? Should I push on into Dante at this stage? No, um, I, I am gathering a whole helping of of questions from the audience. Oh. All right, then so, let me pause. Yo, let me, yeah, let me try and relay a few of those to you. Okay. Um, so, so let's see, a couple of these in front of me here. Yo. Um, well, how uh, about, yeah, go ahead. How about addressing Voris wrote a Q&A in the Q&A rather than the oh. chat box, but you, you know, I, w I was able okay. to go over there and say, oh, somebody else is talking over here. How do you relate this to the dark feminine? and how that relates to what we're going on with today, because there seems to be a real absence of, I won't necessarily say it's all the dark feminine, but we have a, a chthonic absence today about deep feeling that is just not coming through in the culture. There's a, it seems to be a lack of hope, there's like, we don't know where the end in sight. We're stuck in this prolonged liminality where 
we don't know what the end is or where it's going to come or how it's going to appear. And we need some guidance. And that guidance has to come from the deep sense of what it is to be soulful and to be human. Because that's what we're seeking. And where would you put Hestia in that? I mean, she seems to be kicked out of the house. Yes. <clears throat> Well, you touch on a couple of the qualities absent, and uh, maybe this is a synonym for one that you mentioned, but a, a woeful absence of depth and a, a super abundance of distractions. And that's not accidental. <clears throat> I remember, uh, and it's been, I don't know, maybe four or five years now, <clears throat> the uh, fierce and ferocious attacks on liberal arts learning and on the humanities. Now listen to one radio show in which a man castigated and chastised the parents of a child who was majoring in art history. Mm. And he found that blasphemous and insulting. And he said, how economically <clears throat> is, is your child uh, going to support him or herself? I can't remember if it was a young uh, man or woman, uh, studying such nonsense. And I was just flabbergasted. I think I missed that transition. Um, but there have been a number of governors of states in the United States who have um, cut any funding for uh, humanities education. And of course, they're always after PBS and uh, NEH, uh, National Endowment. Um, I don't think <clears throat> one can have a consuming culture um, <clears throat> and a reflective culture. Uh, that <clears throat> there's a choice that seems to be pushed that has to be made. I don't quite believe it because I think there is a balance of both consuming and contemplating. I don't think they necessarily cancel each other out. I know that I'm not addressing the dark feminine. I'm not sure. Um, and I wish I knew more uh, that uh, Voris is uh, uh, posing. And I, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear from uh, Voris and um, his thoughts on that. But this absence of depth and a uh, addiction to being entertained and being passive I think are just addictive vices that are creating uh, what Nicholas Carr, Nicholas Carr calls the shallows. You know, I don't know if you know that book. He is, he's brilliant on the way technology is affecting our brains. <clears throat> and he begins the book with a conversation of two Yale buddies from years past who made enormous fortunes in the dot-com industry. And they admitted to him that they were incapable of reading a novel anymore because they said, <clears throat> our world has been in bites and bits. And to <clears throat> read a novel is to <laughs> retain what has happened to understand what is happening and maybe see what is going to happen. They said, we're incapable of doing that anymore. They said, our brains have been rewired to the point <clears throat> that we can't even concentrate on something for more than a couple of minutes. And I just found his book apocalyptic in his insights. Um, so I think, and I don't mean to sound conspiratorial here, um, but it's engineered. It's being engineered. Yeah, it's, been, it's being engineered to uh, cancel out the ability to reflect on something and to discern something in it outside of one's own ideologies. So I, I've got something to add to that, Dennis. Please. Uh, some Please. of you may know that uh, <laughs> Lewis wrote a book uh, called The Screwtape Letters, and it was, it was subtitled mm -hmm. How to Corrupt a Christian Soul. So it's all about how to corrupt people, right? Yes. And one of the greatest insights in there was 
keep people in the stream. And this is before there was streaming. This is the, by this he meant newspapers, right? But the point is, as long as you're consuming information, you're not reflecting on it. That's right. So if you have, so keep right. people in the stream so that we're constantly stimulated will, will keep us from ever reflecting. Yes. Which by the way, also keeps us more likely to maintain or sustain the perspectives presented by the stream than whatever we might generate through reflection. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's the, the elimination of the pause. It's the elimination of the pause so that there is no, there is no dead air time. And I, by that I mean a time to reflect on what, <clears throat> what one has been taking in. Yeah. On that, that note, let me say, uh, you know, on pause and on slowing down and taking time, uh, we talked this earlier this afternoon, you, we were talking about, well, how long do we want these to go? An hour and a half and two? And we said, uh, well, things just start to get good about an hour and a half in. Uh, that's when, you know, and so I'm going to suggest that we um, stick with this topic, continue to let it breathe and open and have warmth and space, and try, instead of trying to squeeze in a second one, if that sounds right to you. I'm, I'm fine, as you and I spoke, <clears throat> and I think the spirit of this <clears throat> insists on it, um, <clears throat> we're all in an experiment here. So let's see how it goes. <clears throat> let's see if um, this much is too much, not enough. So I want to stay very loose and flexible. And quite honestly, I'm very interested in, in some of the participants and I thank all of you, first of all, but also some of the participants. I'd love to hear mm -hmm. your riff on uh, any part of this and extending and it. To the participants, I'm going to call you out on this one thing. You've got to watch out for the master teachers because sometimes they're working on two or three layers ahead of us. I know that the, uh, the medium in the message, right? So what you've done, if, for those of some of us have noticed, uh, you've just informed the medium with your message. <laughs> uh, by presenting on Hestia, you've informed our approach to what, to what we're doing. Uh, how brilliant, Mr. Miyagi. Uh, <laughs> um, so, so anyway, I do think that that's wonderful because talking about Hestia has helped us create space, not just for how we as a panel will relate, how these sessions will be engaged, but yes. also uh, you've also backdoored in how the imagination relates to itself and how we relate to the imagination by talking about Hestia. Uh, so thank you and, and yes. is open enough to the audience. I just wanted to acknowledge yeah, th it. Thank you, that. Thank you for that, Will. Yes. I would, I, would please, also, yes. Please. I would also say, Dennis, that we have <laughs> a group of people, all of whom are bright, educated, have insights, but we've kept them out. And by putting a group of us in here, I think what we can do, if, if we can do it successfully, is have people raise their hands. They can come in as a voice, which is like a window. Yeah. It doesn't turn it into one of those Zoom sessions where you have 40 postage stamps sitting up there and you can't see who people are. Yeah. But, but we'll have to figure out a way to orchestrate this. And I have control okay. over that so that I can bring a panelist box up. Uh, there was one repeating question that has come up. And Dennis, I'm going to put this one to bed. There's very few problems that I can solve in life, but this is one of them. <laughs> Would you spell Barbara's last name? K-I-R-K-S-E-Y. <clears throat> Kirksey. Yep. Kirksey. Kirksey. Great. You know, we have just slayed Quite a few dragons with that. <laughs> you brought her up, and is that an essay that maybe I could get from you? Oh, oh yes, it's in Facing the Gods. Okay, it's the in edited, Facing the Gods. The edited okay. volume of James Hillman. It's a beautiful uh, volume. Uh, I didn't pull it off my shelf, but I think there are seven essays. Artemis, Athena, Hestia, I think Dionysus. Anyhow. It's, it's just a gem that, that uh, James Hillman, of course, invited these different people 
to uh, submit. And I remember Barbara, she was a year behind me. Uh, I started in 1972 on the doctorate at mm -hmm. University of Dallas. She came in in uh, 73 and she was a brilliant student and I got to be good friends with her. And so when I saw her name in the essay, in the collection, I thought, well, I'm going to see what Barbara, how Barbara's been thinking about myth and archetypes, and it, what a treat. So she, she was my foundation for what I presented to all of you uh, this evening, and I tried to give her credit at every point that I was pulling uh, from her work. Yeah, she's, she's, right. and, and I've tried to contact her, not any luck, and I don't know if she's done any other publishing, to be quite honest, except for the dissertation. Yeah. I, I will locate her work and uh, maybe make a copy of it and make it available. It'd be beautiful. Uh, yes. Our first guest from the gallery is Edward. So if you have a question for Dr. Slattery or any of us, uh, go for it. Yeah. Dennis, this is Ed Smink. Thanks. Oh, Ed, I recognize your voice. Glad you're yes. here. Uh, thank you so much. I'm, um, I'm very interested in, in how Hestia is an, an attitude of the soul. And what came to mind for me was the um, classical understanding of discernment. So using the word focus, I, I'm wondering if you could also entertain to, to discern to discern what is what the soul is asking of you, and also uh, both personally and both individually, and it's it's a classical understanding of Ignatius of Loyola, to uh, 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 with the concept of discerning the spirit. What is the right spirit to act out of? So yeah. um, that's my uh, uh, question. Also, how you tied in hospitality, and and not only the the sense of uh, the, the the host with the guest, but also the re, also the understanding of what happens between the host and the guest, and then yes. also what happens interiorly because of that action. That's the that's a new understanding I learned in in the research I did for my book that you yes. um, helped me um, articulate. Thanks very much. Yes. So Ed is the author of the Soul of the Ed, help me. The soul of the caregiver, or the soul of caregiving. Oh, maybe he can't hear me now. Yeah. So I worked. Uh, I chaired his dissertation, and his, his life has been spent uh, as a caregiver uh, professionally. Um, geez, he tossed um, a number of things out there. Uh, let me let me pick it up where uh, I intuitively feel I ought to move to. Um, I spent four and a half years writing this book, From War to Wonder, Recovering Your Personal Myth Through Homer's Odyssey. And it was published uh, last, the last week of December of 219. And um, it's, it's on the, uh, its uh, structure is on the order of day-to-day -day Dante and our daily breach. One page per day for 365 days. So maybe eight to nine lines from the Odyssey um, per page. Um, what I noticed in doing that was something I hadn't noticed in teaching it over many, many years. <clears throat> and that is the way that Homer understands the fluid nature of the guest and the host so that in conversation, um, you, you may host um, a guest's speaking, and then the roles are reversed, and the guest becomes the hosting of your speaking. So it's fluid, it's reciprocal, it's hospitable, and it leaves space for the voices of the two. And of course, it could be uh, more. Um, the piece on discernment enters the Odyssey through the figure primarily of Athena. And she says to uh, Telemachus, 
in book two. She appears as Mentes um, and is completely ignored because the suitors, obsessed with their own appetites, have no understanding of hospitality. In fact, they would see a stranger coming in as, oh, this is another mouth to feed, and that's going to be less food for us in that kind of stingy, acquisitive, um, uh, super consumer mentality. But Telemachus, who has been taught the laws of hospitality, approaches him because she's disguised as a man and brings her into the house and finds a place for her to sit. And she um, has one question for him. Are you open and willing to be taught? If you're not, I'm out of here. If you are, I will tutor you. And at that moment, he becomes a student. And Ed, this is, this is a movement of his soul. Now, it's so fascinating to watch this act of hospitality be rewarded by this goddess. He doesn't know that she's a goddess, but she begins to school him. And up to that point, he's been a whining 20-year-old. And woe is me. And my mother and I are victims. Once Athena brushes against Telemachus' soul, in the next scene, he steps in front of the 108 suitors. I mean, this is a gang who do nothing but party and consume all day, and then they go back to their houses. And these are the, uh, these are the uh, young um, men of the Aristoi of Ithaca. These are, these are the well-heeled. When, when Telemachus opens his mouth, he speaks with such authority that the suitors stop eating and look, at, look up at him. And they, Homer describes, and then they put, their, they, <laughs> they put their upper teeth against their lower lip. Now they know they have an adversary because he speaks with the voice of authority. It's just a marvelous moment in learning where he is, where he is hospitable to the wisdom of this stranger and in exchange begins to, re, begins to not reclaim, he begins to claim his own voice and his own authority. <clears throat> and now he speaks as a host in the household. <clears throat> and not a whining guest. So, Ed, I don't know if you can hear me, but I hope that uh, some of that touches on discernment. See, what he learns with his voice of authority is to discern. And the suitors know in their hearts that this is somebody that is courageous and um, eloquent and persuasive in his speaking. That's the power of Athena's um, discerning uh, capacity. Yeah, and it's just, it's just one of the most eloquent moments in the entirety of the 24 books that comprise uh, the Odyssey. Yeah. So others maybe. Yeah. Yeah, because I have almost 10 tills, so of course we're not going to touch uh, Dante uh, tonight, but please, any others? Hello. This is Sheila. Hi, Sheila. Hi, Dennis. Uh, you know that I'm coming from a birth psychology place. And yes. yes. A little bit more somatic than Jungians are used to, probably. <laughs> but uh, um, Francis Mott wrote Mythology of Prenatal Life. And hmm. in it, he's got a picture of a a drawing of a severed umbilical cord. There are two veins and one artery, and in that cord, which which through which nutrition passes, um, is it, it forms a spiral. 
the place that it implants is a circle. So I think it's a way of, mm. of considering that perhaps we are getting these ideas for our myths prenatally because we're embodying them. I'd like to know your opinion on that. No, that's wonderful. Mm. One of my dissertation students years ago put me onto a book entitled Body Eloquence. Oh, yes, I have the book. Do you have that? Yes. And I, I know it's on my shelf over here. I'm, I'm not going to go and get it, but, yeah. um, and I'm forgetting the author, but that's the title. And she, the woman who wrote it, <clears throat> works with trauma, traumatized women, I think exclusively. And she came to the recognition that different organs of the body prefer and gravitate towards certain narrative themes. So the liver has one set of themes that it seems to attract. Um, the gallbladder, because I don't have one, I can speak of the present absence or the absent present of it. Each organ is narratively inflected, narratively attuned. And part of her therapy with women, uh, and especially, if, and boy, it's been so many years since I read it, but you, you tripwired the title, and I, I know where it is on the shelf. Um, this woman was suffering from breast cancer. So the woman who wrote the book began, I guess what I would call a narrative therapy, <clears throat> where she began to read to and have this woman read back to her narratives that were, um, I don't want to say compatible, but in tune with um, her breast cancer, which then went into remission. So I, and Sheila, I, you tell me if I'm, um, uh, I lost my guardrails and I'm off track here, but <clears throat> There's something, you know, if, if every story harbors a mythology that is shaping the narrative and maybe being shaped by it in a reciprocal uh, relationship, which is what I sense, then um, <clears throat> the, plot, the plot becomes the transport vehicle, I'm stealing Campbell's language there, for carrying that myth deep into the tissues of the body and can affect healing. So Sheila, respond to that to see if I, if I got to it at all. Um, yes, I still think though, and you mentioned in your talk many, many times, connective tissue. And the idea is, is that we do not need cognition. This is, we get somatized with these patterns of me metabolic forces that pull and push and twist and shear us, and that we remember that yes. cellularly. Yes. So yes. it's not dependent on cognition. And no. um, I love the fact that you mentioned it was uh, Nancy Mellon, I think her name Nancy is. Nancy Mellon, thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So thanks, Den uh, Dennis, for uh, considering that. Uh, I, I'm an analysand for many, many years, um, and I've made meaning out of my own life because of my embodied experiences of prenatal memory. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you for that, Sheila. We have when Do we have time? Do we have time? For yeah, we, we're good. Yeah. Yes. Hey, Dennis, it's Wendelin. Oh, hi, Wendelin. I'm glad you're part of the group. Yeah, I, I was able to get enough bandwidth to make it. A couple observations and, and a couple questions. Yeah. Uh, the first is that um, for the action of Hestia, I seem to remember, and I'd have to track down the specific references, but I also remember artistically, uh, images of Hestia accepting and nurturing a divine child. Oh, okay. So that might will definitely fit into what you have. The secondary concept, I had two questions, but I can merge them in, into one. As you said about the Greek culture, 
culturally, I see, and I hope you would recognize this as well, that Hestia as a Parthenos, which is an unmarried maiden, is very different from Vesta, a Virgo intacta. I think that allows Hestia to take more people in oh, and to be great. more autonomous. And then also, so that's culturally a difference between the Roman and the Greek. And then you yeah, also, very if, you helpful. At, if you look at the figure of Agni in Hindu, yeah. Agni as a male consumes and maybe, and on some level transmits the sacrifices, but he's mainly uh, the fire of consumption, whereas Hestia is the fire of warming. And I kind of see that as the Greeks having a heavy survival of pre-Indo-European cultural context versus what happened by the time the Indo-Europeans reached uh, the, the Hindu state. So I just wanted to bring that forward to you in case that, you know, you could riff off it or if you think it's helpful, that's all I wanted to do. So I no, wanted to thank you for that. That's beautiful. No, that's, that's new knowledge for me, uh, Wendlin. You gave me a broader, you gave me a broader frame in which to understand her. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, let's go with Mariam. Um, hang on, here we go. She'll be up in a sec. Yeah. Should be there. Mariam? Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Good, Mariam. Dennis. I miss yes. you terribly. It's so nice to see Thanks, you and hear you here. Thank you for that. I'm glad you're here, Mary. I'm beautiful. Um, I have a question for you yeah. uh, about Hestia. But first, how great to just be considering Hestia right now with all of this time spent at home. It's really <laughs> making me kind of wonder you know, how at home do I feel at home? and How, you know? How, yes. how warm is my heart? And I'm, um, I think it's probably, it's probably a, a, a cultural condition right now, mm -hmm. is the question of home. But my, my, I would love to yeah. hear you speak about um, you know, the fact that in uh, the Homeric Hymn to Aphrodite, it's very specifically kind of noted that the only three goddesses who aren't susceptible to her powers are Athena, Artemis, and Hestia. Ah. Right? Beautiful. No, the, the, thank you for this. This is great. So I would, you know, I'd love to hear you riff if, if it's available to you on the difference between the heartfeltness of a Hestia and, an, you know, an, an Aphroditic kind of heartfeltness. Yeah. You know, I... I'd love to go back and read that. Uh, I'm just thinking. Um, uh, I'm just thinking about how they might be different. Let me let me toss it back, and ask you because you're closer to that um, him. What are your thoughts, or what struck, or strikes you, in that difference between Aphrodite and Hestia? I've got to unmute her again. Oh, okay. There we go. Uh, go yeah. ahead, please. Well, all, no, all I can, I, all I can imagine right now is just because of the own my my own work that I'm doing with Aphrodite in the dissertation, and just this oh, kind of noticing that what that what that means is that really the only only three beings that the only mortal and divine that aren't susceptible to her, this Athena, Artemis, and Hestia, that means that they don't require intimate connection. Like they don't actually uh -huh. feel any sort of um, that like loneliness and longing. Uh, and so, yes. right? I mean, I, th I think I'm... So the, am, am I... Am I am I tracking you in understanding that Athena, uh, Artemis, Aphrodite are, for lack of a better term, more distant goddesses? Or Athena, Ar Athena, Artemis, and, and Hestia. Yeah, they don't. They don't. Yes, Hestia. They don't connect yeah. on a on a very personal and intimate level. 
No, that's interesting to me because it seems that Hestia is um, so um, heartfeltly connected to others um, and hospitable yeah. to others. So maybe I'm missing something, uh, Miriam. Well, there's a, I guess there's a difference between her connection and an aphroditic, you know, erotic, needy, <laughs> um, yes. you know, like it's a different, different level of intimacy. And maybe that's why she can connect with so many is because she doesn't, she does have a sense of wholeness in, in herself that doesn't uh, need to reveal to another or have a one to like a real, whatever, whatever the aphroditic connection is. I'm not going to say it's real and Hestia's is unreal. That's ridiculous. But I, I don't have an answer. I'm just no. not yet. I agree. I'm, 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 sensing, know that, I'm sensing that Hestia is more like the ground of being and other activity based or doing based gods like yeah. Aphrodite, which are, High, highly relational. Um, every everything you see about Aphrodite is about that love and strife, yes. and and it's the att attraction principle that drives Aphrodite, you know, to Ares and Hephaestus and you know these various gods that she has these relations with. But Hestia is always like Artemis, you know. Um, a, a very, a, it's more of a condition, you know, and it's certainly yes. not, no, you, she doesn't pal around with anybody and, you know, it's just not who she is constructed by the Greeks to be. You know, I, I wanted to mention, uh, and, and yes. hi, Miriam. Hi, uh, <laughs> I just wanted to mention to you, uh, that Plato's ultimate form is love and the highest, highest forms are not, what we think of when we think of forms because Aristotle totally ruined us into thinking that a form is of a horse. No, a form is, is beyond those specifics for Plato. And the ultimate form is something like love. And Plato bifurcated um, Aphrodite into the universal Aphrodite and the kind of embodied specific Aphrodite. And to me, it seems like, you know, maybe Hestia is much more in line with that universal Aphrodite. It's more kind of like the love, as the ground of being, to me, seems yes. very shared between the universal Aphrodite and Hestia. Yeah, I think that's right, and I think she's she's a presence mm -hmm. of those qualities that Barbara was de uh, uh, developing, and that I tried to add to. And so it's she's in that respect, she's maybe. And this is uh, what I was hearing Dana say too. She's more ontological mm -hmm. than she is existential. I mean, if I could maybe try to use that as a, a way of speaking about her um, not only being grounded, but being ground itself. Mm -hmm. um, and then off of that come all these different forms of affection, toleration, patience, uh, restraint. Uh, the ability to listen, um, the ability to converse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Miriam, I hope that helps uh, even a little bit. There was a question from the audience uh, as you close. Uh, if there's anything that you recommend they read, or any, anything anybody would benefit from reading before next uh, two weeks from now? Well, I, I, would, I would love to pick up on the Dante side uh, La Vida Nuova, uh, which is available in a very inexpensive paperback. Um, that's something that um, people could read, and I think they would enjoy reading the 41 sonnets that Dante is, lays out as his, as his creative life starts to take shape. Um, yeah, and then I think I'll, I'll have ready the second essay that I wanted to um, I wanted to suggest and it's entitled Mimesis Neurology and the Aesthetics of Presence. 
So the mimetic mode, uh, neurological um, uh, insights, and the culmination of those in the aesthetic presencing of something. Mm -hmm. So that's where, that's where I'd like to hit. I mean, I'd like to do the Dante piece, and then we see what the clock is telling us, and then move into that, if that would work. I think people can tell that we are, we want to bring people into the audience in, we want to bring, we hey, we're just, you know, we're, we just want to balance it the best we can and keep, keep iterating and evolving. And, uh, and if you guys have any feedback or thoughts, send it, send it my way. Yes. And selfishly, I'd love to have <clears throat> all of you return. And I know it's a burden on your time. Um, but I just, yeah, you know, selfishly, I'd love to have the five of you there. Five the participants. You're loading us up with helium balloons. <laughs> <laughs> can we go around and Kwame, can you just say something? I love your voice, you know that. <laughs> uh, just happy to be here, Dan. I, I, I appreciate the invite. I'll be back, man. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm cool next. Um, uh, the following two weeks. So I'm just, uh, good. Yeah. Just happy to be here, brother. So thank you, man. Thank you very yep. much. Thanks, uh, Dara. And Dara. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, thank you. This is, this is so wonderful. I mean, part of what happened to all of us when we left Pacifica, it was like, oh, well, now what, you know? <laughs> and, uh, th this is, um, um, as someone said earlier, you know, you, you get to, uh, chat with your tribe so it's always terrific and I, I just wanted to um, this is very very short but um, Dennis regarding Hestia had said it said in the beginning that she is the beginning and the end and um, uh, you know made me think in our the conversation you were just having about our, our inner feminine center uh, you know uh, of life before judgment and um, there is something um, uh, you've really left me with thinking about um, um, in terms of holding kind of inner hospitality, uh, yeah. a, 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 a space for myself um, yes. to, to, to um, and I don't mean in a, in a selfish way, I mean no, in no, an extended I, way yeah. and, as a participant of life. And, yeah. um, uh, it was very, very powerful. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Dara. Yeah. And how about you, John? Yeah, just great. Thanks to you, Dennis, for uh, such a, a, a rich talk full of so much um, uh, material that I'll, I'll be thinking about for a long time. Um, I'm really excited about watching for Hestia in the next two weeks um, and, and welcoming her. Uh, because I believe um, she's going to appear in unexpected ways and yeah. I'm going to really keep my eye out for her. I think she's being welcomed into uh, our space just by our talking about her. So I'm excited yes. to watch her. That's great, John. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank it's you been all. A wonderful afternoon. And yeah. I I'm deeply appreciative.